We're going to read the Ten Commandments this morning, so let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Then we'll have a wee word of prayer, and then we're going to speak on the threefold purpose of the law. So you may turn if you want to in your Bibles. I would encourage you to do it. The Pew Bible there, Exodus chapter 20, and beginning to read at verse 1. The Word of God for the people of God. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord, your God am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mighty smoking of the, of, of the people that were, were afraid, trembled, and they stood afar and said to Moses, You speak to us, and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us, lest we die. Now, turn right over to the New Testament, to chapter 5 of Matthew. That's in the New Testament, just in case you didn't know, but I know you know. Matthew chapter 5, and beginning to read in verse 17. <clears throat> do not think that I, Jesus speaking here, Sermon on the Mount, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Amen. May we pray. Our Father, we pray now that as we take a look at the relevancy, really, of this great law that you have given, that we have read and that many people perhaps for the first time have listened to today, the Lord, you might just inscribe in a particular way these words on our minds and hearts, especially the ones that relate to us individually. How we thank you for the Spirit of God who comes and literally unpacks, unfolds, slices up this word and gives us understanding to we who are simple. Do that now, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as you know, in the last uh, little while, in fact, it was, I think, two weeks ago, I began a message on the relevancy of the moral law of God. And my purpose when I started out at that particular time was really to debunk the teaching that the Old Testament and the moral law were for a prior time in history and not for today. Because we, as we said back then, have certain Bible teachers within the Church of Jesus Christ even today 
although I would say that this is disappearing somewhat, but certain Bible teachers tend to slice and dice the Bible up into divisions, saying that the Lord's Prayer, reference to the kingdom, the Sermon on the Mount, is for a future time, namely the reign of Christ in the millennium. And with that, I disagree, and I do not believe the Bible teaches that. And these same teachers are individuals who make the Lordship of Christ an addition to Christ being your Savior. In other words, you can have Jesus as your Savior, but not as your Lord. And one of our great seminaries in our country that I have great respect for has cranked out many a young man, well-educated in Greek and Hebrew and everything else, but who have taught, and I have their books in my study, some of them, who have taught that you can have him as Savior and yet not have him as Lord. And I want to just set that aside this morning and tuck it away somewhere, bury it in the ground, by, because of what Peter said on the day of Pentecost. He said, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. That's Acts 2, 36. And then Pilate, Paul and Silas with their backs all bruised and bloody and bleeding and sweaty were singing songs in that Philippian jail and the Philippian jailer, remember, came in and they said to everybody, you know, stay where you are, jailer, don't kill yourself. And remember, they said to him, he said, what must I do to be saved? And they said to him, in Acts 16, 31, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. So the fact is this, if I'm a disciple of Christ and you claim to be a disciple of Christ today, if I'm a disciple of Christ, I am under his lordship when I am saved. He is my master and I am his servant. From the get-go, the moment you believe, he's not only your savior, but he is your Lord as well in your life. So when Jesus came, he came to fulfill the laws we've read this morning and everything that the Old Testament foreshadowed about him. Remember the last time we said that the three hats, of course, that he wore, or what is called the three offices of Christ, prophet, priest, and king, he fulfilled in his ministry and in his life. He fulfilled the ceremonial law as prophet and priest. And how did he do that? He brought to us the will of God or the truth of God for our salvation as a prophet. And he offered himself as a sacrifice for our sin. So that's important to just inscribe in your mind when it comes to the law. How did he fulfill it? Here it is. He fulfilled the ceremonial law as a prophet and a priest. And then he fulfilled the civil law as king, establishing a new kingdom. And this is where certain people and certain Bibles that have been written with certain notes will say, ah, this isn't for today. This is a hiccup in the will of God. The church is kind of just an inter... It, it, it's in between. No, it's not. It's a whole part of the process of God and what he's doing in this world of ours. Ever since Genesis 3.15, Jesus began preaching. <laughs> what did he say? He said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Matthew 4, 17. And the wise men identified the baby Jesus as what? The king of the Jews. And then he fulfilled the moral law as savior. He fulfilled the moral law in our place. So Jesus did everything he was supposed to do as promised in the law and the prophets. And that's why he said, I have come not to abolish them, the law and the prophets, but I've come to fulfill them. So what all did he fulfill? Well, all the mosaic institutions, the priesthood, the sacrifices, the tabernacle, and the temple, all fulfilled in Jesus in such a way that they are to be set aside in their original form. So it's all tucked away. It's put back. It's gone. So according to Jesus, the moral law, not the civil law, not the ceremonial law, that's all past. He's fulfilled it. And he fulfilled the moral law too. But the moral law is the one part of the law, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, that is still relevant today. We must believe that. It's essential as a part of our sanctification as far as that goes. So Jesus said this, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law 
until all is accomplished. Remember we said two weeks ago that John Gerstner, that great scholar with the Lord now, said this. He said, Christians are not under the law. Not as, he said, Christians are under the law, not as a meritorious basis for gaining eternal life, but as a necessary lifestyle. If we get that right, then we get it right, shall I say. So, since the moral law is still relevant today, what is its purpose for society and for us as Christians? And by the way, let me say this. The moral law is for the world, not just for the church. It's for Africa. It's for Iceland. It's for Canada. It's for the United States. The moral law is for all of them. And did you realize that in a way, since the beginning of mankind, that moral law that actually came out on Sinai was already built into Adam's heart and life, was already there. So on Sinai wasn't the first time that we have the Ten Commandments. Already it was built into the fabric of Adam himself. Unfortunately, he fell. So we go back to the august reformer, John Calvin, who succinctly states its threefold purpose. I'm going to restate it in my own words for our understanding today. But this is, this is perfect. He said this, and this is not to quote him verbatim, but he said, number one, the moral law is to be a mirror reflecting God's righteousness and our unrighteousness. And it certainly does that. Secondly, the moral law is to restrain evil, protecting the just from the unjust and punishing the guilty. And that's true. We see it today all around us. If you see a policeman, you see how it restrains evil. And thirdly, he said, to be a guide for the believer unto good deeds, thereby glorifying God. Now, let me just say this before we begin and take a look at this and kind of give more detail to it. Before I unpack these three purposes, I just want to add this prelude to it, really. Decalogue means ten words. You have heard me so many times use the word decalogue, and you know it refers to the Ten Commandments, but what does decalogue actually mean? It just means ten words. That's what it actually means. So when we speak of the Ten Commandments or the moral law or the decalogue, we're speaking of those ten commandments that were given back in Sinai to Moses, to the people of Israel, and really to the whole world as far as that goes. So you know as you take a look at it, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, as you take a it seems so negative, doesn't it? And on the surface, the Ten Commandments seem to be a very negative statement, but it isn't. And why isn't it? It's because Jesus said the top four are tantamount to loving God. And the bottom six are tantamount to loving our neighbor. And they're both positive. To love God is positive. To love your neighbor is very positive. So when we take a look at the Ten Commandments in that particular light, although it says, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, yet when you come over to the New Testament and see Jesus, how he explains the commandments, all of them, all ten, how that we're to love God and love our fellow man, you can see that the Ten Commandments are from its early register seemingly negative, but then when you look at what Jesus said, it really is a positive statement that is made there. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, Matthew 22, 37 through 39. So here's how I want to address this morning these three purposes of the law. You ready? First, the law functions as a strip search. Whoa. Secondly, the law functions as a preventative. Thirdly, the law functions as a guidepost. It's relevant for that reason today. So let's take up the first one then. The law functions as a strip search. What in the world does that mean? Well, let me explain it to you in these four particular main Subpoint, shall I say, God's law determines what sin is. You don't. Neither do I. Neither does the church. Who determines what sin is? 
the one who gave the law. Who's that? God. But what about the church? For example, we are to be salt and light. Are we not being a law in society? Are we not in many ways saying, thou shalt not? Well, I suppose you could say it like that when you put it that way, but let me say this. The Roman Catholic Church, of course, has tried to do that. They have said that there are venial sins and mortal sins. Now, what are venial sins? They're small type sins, sins that you can be pardoned of, like idle words, small theft, etc., things like that. But mortal sins are sins that remove grace from the person and so deserve death. So the Roman Catholic Church, way back in history, came down with this. Bishops and all of the great minds came together and said, now, this is what determines what sin is. There are sins that are venial sins, forgivable. There are sins that are not, and they are mortal sins. But the thing about it is this. God determines what sin is, not the church. Jesus, however, regarded no sin as small. No sin is small. Any sin can send you to hell. We know that. The Bible says all our righteous deeds are as polluted garment. That's Isaiah 64, 6. None righteous. None is righteous. No, not one. Romans 3, 10. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. And James said this. He put it down so well. He said, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. So Jesus is right. We knew he was right, of course, that he regards no sin as small. And may I say this, no state, no state, no country determines what sin is. It really doesn't, such as politicians and governments. Now, our country, illegally, I think, against God's law, has legalized abortion. That's against murder right there. We are breaking the law every day in this country. Many nurses, many doctors are involved in doing this. And so are same-sex marriages, which God, throughout the Old Testament, in the New Testament, makes it very clear, is definitely not to be done. So in our country, we have looked at the law of God and said no to it, and we're paying the price, I think, as we see what's taking place within our culture and within our nation so it's not the church, it's not the state, it's not society's whims and wishes and desires that determines what sin is. For example, I have told you there's one store I will not go to because they've made their bathrooms neutral. Now that's my thing, I don't care what you do, but that's what I'm doing. I recently had a call from our health care, and they said, we're going to give you a $15 card to that. And I said, it's not necessary to that store. Well, changing your gender, too. That's what society is doing today, which, of course, you can't do. You're either a man or a woman. You're either a boy or a girl. And no matter what you take and what you do and what you place in or take off, <laughs> pardon me for saying that, you're still what you are because it's built into your psyche. It's built right into your DNA, shall I say. It really is. And yet we've got in society today, you know, I want to be a man, I want to be a woman, and we have all these gay bars and such as this that's going on, all this crazy transgender stuff. And then our own, own, own state, as you know, throughout our governor for this very reason about these bathrooms and about the particular B something to you know what it is what I'm talking about that was passed and uh, such as that or not passed but it's not autonomy either autonomy personal autonomy every doing a person doing what he thinks is right and just and all of that is is not the thing that determines God's will concerning sin I get a magazine, which I don't appreciate pr very much. It's uh, for people that are young like me. But Willie Nelson is on the front cover. My, he looks terrible. He's 85, sitting on a motorcycle. And this is what he said. He said, I'm still doing what I want to do, and I suggest everybody do the same thing. That's the mindset today. Or what Frank Sinatra is saying. Do you remember what he's saying? I did it my way. He sure did. And you know where he is now? Well, I think we can only guess.
But I just point out these particular things because it is God's who determines what is sin. Second thing is that God's law determines the degree of sin. Pride appears to be specifically bad because it made Satan crash and burn. And obviously, I think, as we take a look at this and kind of strip it apart, sins against the top half of the law that are Godward are more serious than those against the bottom half, which are manward. That's important to look at. I think sins against God are more grave than sins against our fellow man. And I think there's scripture that would back that up. Thirdly, God's law determines the odiousness of sin. God's law determines the odiousness of sin. One of my professors when I was in undergraduate school used to say, light thoughts about sin means light thoughts about God. I've never forgotten that. Oh, Dr. Minder, he used to say that over and over again. The Bible says, for the payoff of sin is death. That's how odious it is. Romans 6.23, for the payoff of sin is death. That's how bad it is. That's how odious it is to God. So sin is so despicable, so despicable that God couldn't leave it unpunished. He had to punish it the only way that he could punish it in his only begotten son. That's how bad sin was. That's how odious it was. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, 1 Peter 3.18. And then 2 Corinthians 5.21. For your sake, the sake of the sinner, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Fourthly, God's law drives sinners to see their need for Christ. It drives them to see their need for Christ. The law shows us what we are, and grace shows us what we can be. Isn't that wonderful? The law points out our problem, that we're sinners, in all that we do that's so odious to God, and the gospel follows up with the solution and hope. The law strips us down and convicts us of our sin. Romans 3.20 says this, Through the law comes the knowledge of sin. That's why the law is so helpful. You won't find that in the gospel. The gospel is full of grace and hope and mercy, but it's the law that's necessary to be preached along with the gospel in order that we can know what sin is. Through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So it shows us that we miserably fall short of the righteousness of God. That's this benefit of the law in that it gives us a strip search. Let me say it again. It shows us that we miserably fall short of the righteousness of God. So sin is something done or said or desired which is contrary to law. Now the second thing I want you to notice this morning about the law is this. Not only that the law functions as a strip search, and boy that's so helpful when you're witnessing the gospel of Jesus Christ and if you don't have a little piece of gospel paper or gospel verses that first start out with the fact that the person is a sinner as in need of a savior, then you are not dealing with the gospel as you should. Because you begin with the gospel, then you move on to grace, which is hope. So the law shows us what we are and the gospel shows us what we can be. Secondly, then, the law functions as a preventative. It functions as a preventative. Try to imagine a society that is lawless. Now, we'll make it relevant for today. Where Black Lives Matter or Black Panthers or the white supremacists suffer no consequences. Think of what it would be like to have a society like that. Where it's the survival of the fittest. Where there's no regard that all mankind has made in God's image. Hitler was like that when it came to the Jews. Very much he was that way. That there was no regard that all mankind has made in God's image. He felt that they were less than that. Remember going back to the book of Genesis prior to the worldwide flood that we've got in the book of Genesis here. It was such a time as I'm describing here, a time of lawlessness. Genesis 6, 5 says this, The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And then the flood came, and Noah alone and his family were saved. And it says, 
God shut the door. Noah didn't. God shut them in. No one else could get in. They were the chosen ones. The rest all perished. So the law provides consequences. It, it, it acts as a restraint of evil. We know that today in our world. God established what authority that there is. Romans 13, 1 says, For there is no authority except from God. And authority's purpose, authority's purpose is to provide law and order. So law, what it does, it threatens the lawless and provides justice and freedom for all. But if you do wrong, Romans 13, 4 says, be afraid, for he, the authority, does not bear the sword in vain. So law threatens the lawless and provides justice. So we've got the police and the courts and prisons. These are all deterrents. And it's part of this second purpose of the law as a preventative. But what's the third one? It's not only a strip search. It's not only that and a preventative, but the law functions as a guidepost. Now, I want you to hear me out clearly on this one because this is where it's very relevant to all of us in the room that are here today. First, it's a guidepost of God's person, the law is. It reveals his nature and character, what God is like. What is God like? Well, the law gives us a description, really, of what God is like. He is perfect in what he thinks, what he feels, what he desires, what he does, and what he says. He's just perfect in all of those particular areas. The law reveals what a perfect God he is. But secondly, it's a guidepost for us. It's a guidepost for Christians. It's a guidepost for our behavior. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, Matthew 5, 48. Do you know many individuals have tried to take that and kind of lessen it down and weaken it and dilute it, I would say, by saying, oh, that's just dealing with imputed righteousness, that alien righteousness that comes from God. No, it's not. It's not at all. Jesus is dealing with the Sermon on the Mount. He's going through all these various things that were being taught at that particular time. The law, he's making it very clear. And he comes along and says, right at the end there in chapter 5, he says these particular words, verse 48, You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's the goal. Granted, we fall short of it, but that's still the goal. Nothing short of that for us as children of God. And then Leviticus 19.2 said this, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. That's what God is. He's perfect and he's holy. And that's why in our behavior he wants us to be that way too. So when we follow, when we follow the law, our lifestyle imitates God's character and conduct. That's what's taking place. The law mirrors God's conduct. And when we imitate, live out that law in our lives, we are imitating God's character itself. So when we follow the law, our lifestyle imitates God's character and conduct. The law of God, said Samuel Rutherford, honeyed with the love of Christ has a majesty and power to keep from sin. So it's important to know this, I think, because we've got a big fat Bible here. And we've just got Ten Commandments. And is this it? Are there not other commandments in the Word of God? Well, I think you can answer that question yourself. This is what's important to know, that the, the moral law, the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, is explained, it's explained, expanded, and applied by other commandments in the Bible to various situations. For instance, in the Old Testament, you've got the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. Do we find any explanation of that in the New Testament? Yes. Ephesians 6, 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. What's happening there? The Old Testament law is being explained, expanded, expressed in the New Testament and applied. Go back again to the Old Testament law where you've got the 10th commandment, you shall not covet. 
Do we find that in the New Testament? Many places. One of them is Hebrews 13.5, where it says this, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. He's dealing with the law of covetousness. Thou shalt not covet. So this is the beauty of the Bible, how that those Ten Commandments, that Decalogue, that moral law that you've got there, grows throughout the Bible, and we see it expanded, explained, and applied in different situations and circumstances, and we apply it ourselves in that particular way. So thank God for it. Amen? The moral law of God is, is still cogent. It's still cogent. Still powerful, still forceful, still in force and necessary for today's Christian. So let me restate what I've said. First, the moral law of God, it, it's like having the most thorough physical and mental exam by a doctor. Everything is tested. Everything is exposed. So the law functions as a strip search. Secondly, its purpose, it's like a lion tamer keeping back people from being wild, uncontrolled, and at their worst. It functions as a preventative. Thirdly, and this applies to us especially, I would say, it's like the most competent guide guiding us through dangerous rapids, joys, and sorrows to our heavenly home. It functions as a guidepost. So it functions as a strip search, it functions as a preventative, and it functions as a guidepost. Just to restate what the good doctor many years ago said, Dr. John Calvin, plus others, of course, too. But I want you to, to end up by thinking this, and this is essential, I think. Remember, obeying the law doesn't save us. But we obey it because we are saved. Okay? So etch that in the mind. Obeying the law doesn't save us. But if we're saved, we obey the law. Amen. Let's pray. Father, for all who are here today, we pray that we would have a new respect and regard, even to commit, commit to memory these ten great statements in the Word of God, which are still for us today in this world in which we live. And when we take it out of our schools, when we take it out of public places, when we want to get rid of it, we see a society begin to deteriorate and fall apart. And, oh God, are we not seeing that in our country today? Help us to be voices of the moral law of God, to be light and to be salt in the midst of a degenerate generation. For his namesake we pray, Jesus. Amen.